Hello, everybody, and welcome back to MSB Weekly. I'm Adam Gawkin, joined today by Brian Powell, Brian Hratsky, and Eric Arnold. Today, we're going to be talking some Washington football, Ravens, Army, Navy, a bit of local basketball, Maryland basketball, Maryland football, Wizards, and, you know, general sports news. Not completely in that order, but that's just kind of going to be what we're going to talk about. We're going to start things off with Brian Hratsky. Ravens, huge matchup, I guess, Later tonight is when this will be coming out, Monday Night Football. What should we be expecting? So the Ravens, uh, they're facing the Cleveland Browns. They beat them in the first matchup. Uh, the Ravens have kind of had a midseason skid. Uh, they beat the Cowboys pretty handedly uh, last week. Um, on a Tuesday, uh, they had a, been having a lot of COVID issues, but that's finally seems to be headed in the past. Uh, they're going to be without Des Bryant, who tested positive right before the game against the Cowboys. He was really disappointed, had some fun on Twitter after that. Um, but all his tests came back negative, uh, according to him. Uh, he was tweeting about it, but he is still going to be on the COVID reserve. Even um, They all think it's, it was a false positive. I mean, we don't really know, but something happened. Um so the Ravens will be without Des Bryant. It looks like Cap- Calais Campbell and some others. Uh, uh, Campbell will be missing because of injuries, I assume. I think he was either questionable or doubtful. He was not at full speed. They missed him the past couple weeks before the Steelers game um, or the, before the Cowboys game. He w- did not look like himself. Uh, so the Ravens are, are getting healthier and are – getting past their COVID issues. There are still some tweaks. Um, like I said, uh, Mark Andrews should be back. Uh, that's a huge uh, for the Ravens. They basically played two weeks without a real tight end. Luke Wilson uh, started, uh, and this guy literally came off the street. Um, and now Luke Wilson is hurt. He was the backup since Nick Boyle went down. So the Ravens have had a lot of issues health-wise. And, um, yeah, they've – They've really struggled in the middle part of the season. Their schedule wasn't easy either. The Cleveland Browns, they beat them before this year. Uh, They're favored. I think ESPN had them close to a 65% chance of winning. Um, It'll be interesting to see. Um, But, yes, the Ravens are getting healthier. But have they been playing great? No. They beat a bad uh, Dallas Cowboys team which they should have. Uh, they kind of went back to the basics, which I've been calling for the Ravens for a long time. Like you got to let Lamar run the ball. You got to do what he does best. And when you're someone like Lamar, who does what he does best better than anybody else did it in the NFL, you can't take uh, put handcuffs on him and take that away from him. So um, the Ravens are good at running and they need to keep doing that. Yeah, and it's kind of a must-win game for them this week, considering, you know, where they are in playoff contention right now. I believe they're just out of the playoffs. They've got to win this, especially against a team that's also in the wild card race. Must-win game for them. Do you have any more notes about the game tomorrow? Or I guess like, um, okay, from the time not off the top of my head. Should be a good, good fun Monday night football game. Um, we, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. All right, awesome, man. Of course, as always, Josh Reed has – all of the stuff on the website. Go check all those articles out. Now we'll bring in Brian Powell, talk some Navy football to start the Army Navy game this past weekend. What's been going on with Navy football? Uh, Navy lost to Army 15 to nothing yesterday. It was a defensive struggle, as everybody thought it would be going in. Um, the only touchdown of the game was set up by a, a Navy fumble on their own 15 yard line that Army punched in a couple plays later. Other than that, it was two field goals and a safety for Army. That's how they got their points. Um, Navy's offense has just been bad for the last three games after they came back from their COVID pause that they had to take. Uh, They've started four different quarterbacks this year. Uh, None of them were effective, and it showed particularly in these last three games when their defense finally got their act together. Because they only scored set, they scored seven points against Memphis, six points against Tulsa, and nothing yesterday. So they finished three and seven. Um, it's going to be interesting, an interesting offseason for them because 
they to see what spring practice looks like and also their top quarterback what everybody thinks is their top quarterback is a plebe named Xavier Arline who also is a top five lacrosse recruit for for uh Navy so it's gonna be interesting to see a what the lacrosse season looks like for Navy in these COVID times and b if he can get any time with uh the football staff during lacrosse season so he can try to make up for not having a fall pre- uh, preseason practice. And Navy also did not have spring practice last year because of COVID. So they just need some time on the field to try to. Yeah. And a little, sorry, before you keep talking, a little blurb that they actually had two of their starters. One of the ones on defense, Johnny Hodges, a linebacker, also a lacrosse player. They had two of their starters, quarterback and linebacker. And that's two of their most important positions. Those two way players. So you can keep going now. I just wanted to kind of mention that. Um, so they're see they're not gonna they announced after the game yesterday they're not gonna accept the bowl bid the military bowl said they wouldn't take them since they lost to army and um they even though there's no minimum win requirement for bowls this year because of all the covid cancellations they've just decided they're ending their season so we'll see what spring ball looks like in 2021 yeah and uh i hear couple, you know, local basketball news, a couple things going on. Could you talk us through a bit of that? Sure. Um, Navy, speaking of Navy, their basketball team is on a co- on a 10-day pause for COVID, a COVID issue. They are not – they've canceled the remaining non-conference games and will start Patriot League play after the first of the year. Um, it's going to be interesting in the Patriot League because they've tried to avoid long trips for scheduling because they're trying to stay out of hotels. So Navy's going to mainly play American, Loyola, and the Pennsylvania teams, and then Army, of course. They will not play Colgate, Holy Cross, or Boston U until possibly the tournament if they match up that way. But they will play Army four times this year to get back. And they're also doing a Saturday-Sunday schedule where they play the same team back-to-back. Some of them are at the same site. Some of them are one at one site, one at the other. Um but the two army games will both be, well, there'll be two in Annapolis and then two in at West point and Navy is most likely going to have no fans for any of their home games this year. It's unclear if the midship brigade will be able to go, but the out for outside fans, they will not be allowed. And then for um, other local uh, college teams, Towson is on a, has had their last four games postponed because of COVID issues. They're scheduled to play George Mason this coming week. Uh, we'll see if that happens. Uh, UMBC beat uh, Coppin State today, 66 to 49. Uh, local products from Southern Anne Arundel of Anne Arundel County, Brandon Horvath had 18 and 14 for UMBC in his 100th game as a retriever. Um, they've started off pretty well, but we'll see what happens when they get into America East play. And Morgan and Coppin are also playing games. Coppin lost by 10 at Duke, which everybody thought was a surprise. But as we've seen how Duke's played this year, that's not really that much of a surprise. Um, Loyola and American are both only playing league play. So they won't start until January and have not played a game yet in the uh, in they have not started their regular season yet because they're Patriot League only teams for this year um and i navy's big win before the they paused for covid was they beat georgetown at mcdonough arena which was big for them and something to keep an eye on for going forward is they have a player a guard named cam davis that's one of the top players in the patriot league and it navy it's this is the first time in a while navy's predicted to be a top four team in the patriot league so we'll see if they can hold up for that to that standard once the league play gets started. Yeah, hopefully they can, you know, this COVID has completely kind of destroyed any, you know, sort of, I guess, a lot of games in college basketball. It's been absolutely crazy. You know, Duke has, after two non-conference lo- at, losses at home, they're not playing anymore. And crazy things going on. Thank you so much, Brian, for talking some Navy football and local basketball. All right, awesome. Now bringing in Eric Arnold to talk some Maryland basketball. Uh, to start rough loss this week on Wednesday against Clemson, 67 to 51. I guess tonight from this coming out, 6 p.m., they play ranked Rutgers. What is there to expect? 
Uh, well, that's going to be a tough matchup for them. Uh, quite frankly, um, this is going to be a game of identity, I think, for the Terps. Um, they really, when they played their matchups last year against Rutgers, it was really the Jalen Smith show um, where he had a career high in blocks. Um, he really ran the offense well with Cowan. Um, and those were close games. Even though Maryland was ranked in the top 10, uh, they lost one of those games and they won one of those games. Um, and they, but they were both very competitive, very close games. And right now you've got no Jalen Smith there anymore. Anthony Cowan's not there anymore. Uh, and they're not going to be able to protect the rim like they used to. Um, Rutgers, on the other hand, is bringing back darn near the entire roster, including Ron Harper Jr., who's putting up 22 a game. Um, that's going to be a tough matchup. Now, he has never particularly played well against Maryland. He's only scored 10 points his freshman year, um, in which, which case it was really just garbage time. They got smoked in that game, Rutgers did. Um, and so he was just kind of putting in some late buckets to, to fill the stat sheets. Um, my, my real fear for this game, though, is going to be the other players around him. It's going to be Montez Mathis and Jacob Young. Um, those are the guys who are also averaging 16 points a game. Uh, and to kind of put that in perspective, Maryland doesn't have anybody averaging 16 points a game right now. Um, and they've got three players averaging 16 or more. Um, and that's going to be tough. They've also got a good chance of bringing back Geo Baker. Um, Geo Baker is kind of like one of their big point guards that they bring out. Um, he got hurt with a high ankle sprain earlier this season. Um, and he is, he's excellent in those matchups against Maryland. Um, you know, he doesn't particularly shoot the ball well, um, and he doesn't get the credit for the assist, but if you watch the way that he sets up the offense, um, it's typically the second or third pass, but it all starts with him, um, getting that initial separation from his defender. Um, so those are going to be the players we're going to watch. Maryland needs to figure out who they are quick. Uh, are they, who is their leader? Who's going to lead this team right now? Their leader, at least on the offensive end is Dante Scott. I mean, he's the one who's really putting up the points. He might not win as far as like every category, every game. But when you look down every category, he's the only one who's running on offense. He seemed to be the only one who showed up the entire first half of that Clemson game. Um, you know, and luckily, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to keep him on the bench much longer. They, they keep, they, he started a couple games and I don't see how they, they can keep him there. Um, he needs more minutes. Um, you know, I don't know if it's going to be Marcel. I don't know if it's going to be Wiggins. Um, I don't know who they're going to pull off. Um, but Dante Scott needs to get back in that game. Yeah, and uh, actually also later this week, I think on Friday or Saturday, they also have Purdue. That's another ranked matchup they have to go up against. And then I believe LaSalle. And- they got LaSalle coming later, yep. Yeah, so three games this week for Maryland basketball. Uh, Maryland football, Eric, talk a bit about that. Rough loss also against Rutgers this past week. Right, like I'm not going to New Jersey anytime soon. Uh it, it was frustrating. Um, and, and that's really how I would describe that game in general. It was frustrating to watch. Um, you know, it was 3 nothing at halftime. Um, you know, eventually it became a little bit more competitive and got to overtime, which is a little exciting. Um, but, you know, honestly, as a fan, it, it was one of those games I kind of want to just throw away. Um, you know, they were out with uh, their top offensive weapon, and they were to- out with their top defensive weapon. Um, and then they just had a missed field goal, you know, late. I mean, five turnovers, and they didn't pick up a single one of them. Uh, you know, that's tough. I mean, they, that, it, it feels like a game like they were the better team and they just lost. Um, you know, this whole season with, you know, COVID and everything else and, and games getting canceled, some players being out, um, kind of feels like a throwaway year. Um, it really just gave more credibility to um, uh, the staff, uh, Loxley and his staff. They're bringing in those recruits again. Uh, next year, this is really a setup. Um, I like I like this team. I like where they're headed. Um, I wasn't sure. I knew that Loxley could recruit, but I wasn't sure if he could coach. And I think we're finding out that he can do that. And next year is going to be his third year when those players are really going to start to develop. Um, and I, I think we're really setting ourselves up um, to be more productive, especially in football. Yeah. And although I think also one thing is Lance Lejean is just not it. Um, what happened? Yeah. What? What? He, I have where, no idea. He, he looks just absolutely off. And as you mentioned, the recruiting class Wednesday is the early national signing day. And Maryland has got one hell of a class this year, the 23rd class in the country and yet that's only six in the big 10 and it's uh led by local guys damian chop robinson number one he goes to quince richard high school out in gaithersburg maryland number yeah. top 25 player in the country on 247 sports two more three two more um four stars also on the defensive line where and- they need the most help you know that's that's where they need it and that's where they're going to get some recruits in uh you know and really Loxley's doing a heck of a job selling that you know if we could just get some help here you can start right away and make a difference yeah, and um, I think five of their top six recruits this year are, are are defensive linemen. Then after that, there's a bunch more. And they just lost one about two weeks ago. Marcus Bradley, also from Quince Orchard, he 
flipped to, to Vanderbilt. That would have been four, four stars on the defensive line, but he left for Vandy. But yeah, I mean, recruiting uh, Talia Tungavaiola is going to be back next year on offense. Uh, Penny Boone and Isaiah Jacobs hopefully will be, be better at running back. Rakeem Jarrett is looking good. Offensive line. Looks great. Got to be, a, you know, offensive line. They've got kind of a future, but we'll see how they work. Defensively, they've got young guys, and they're going to have this influx of defensive linemen, all of who are going to be really, really good, and they're going to have one of the best pass rushes in the country. So I think, uh, Eric, that's all you have uh, this week. Thank you so much. Your article is, of course, about Maryland basketball over on the website, MarylandSportsBlock.com. And I guess now here's my show. Uh, start off here talking about some Washington football. Now six and seven this year, just a game under 500 and in first place in the NFC East today, or I guess yesterday, beating the San Francisco 49ers by a score of 23 to 15. And boy, was it a stressful and frustrating game. Just so frustrating. At halftime, they were up 13 to seven, ended up winning 23 to 15. Alex Smith out at halftime, Dwayne Haskins came in. And I think if there's one conclusion that we can take away on the offensive side is that Haskins for sure is not it uh people were hoping that you know what this is his time maybe he can, he can show that he really did change in the time that Alex Smith and Kyle Allen were starting but he didn't he's just really not good missed a couple reads completely overthrew Terry McLaurin who was wide open over the middle in a big play very lucky that it got dropped that could have been an easy interception and changed the game he got lucky. He's just not it. It's unfortunate. We were all rooting for him. He's just not it. Alex Smith uh, sounds like he should be back next week. It does sound like a very serious injury, but he should be back. Uh, they really miss Antonio Gibson. J.D. McKissick and Peyton Barber both had okay games. McKissick had a couple long runs, but really not until the second half were they able to do anything there. Um, receivers, McKissick not at all existed in the past game. That was weird to not see him there. Uh, Peyton Barber actually got more catches than him. That's something that if they're going to have no Gibson, McKissick's got to get the ball more. Terry McLaurin for the second week in a row, just completely locked down. He's getting completely double teamed every single play. It's impossible to get him the ball. Two receptions, 24 yards. He should have had a couple more. Alex Smith missed him a couple times. Haskins missed him a couple times, but he's now over a thousand receiving yards on the year. Uh, That's it for the offensive side over on defense. You can't really call this Chase Young's breakout game just because he's been amazing all year, but he's the real deal. He's going to be the defensive rookie of the year. Just absolutely outstanding. You know, uh, sacks, force fumbled, and he returned a fumble for a touchdown the first time that's ever happened in franchise history. He is just something special. The local kid out of DeMatha, there's just something about him. You can tell he's going to be something different. His speed is just something that's completely unmatched at the defensive line position. He picked up the ball and is like touchdown at around the 40 yard line and returned it all the way with the receivers chasing him. Didn't let them catch him. He had just an outstanding game. Um, Kevin Pierre Lewis had a great sack. He looked pretty impressive. Montez sweat as always played really well. Cameron curl. Uh, the rookie, I think seventh round rookie this past year, he had a pick six, huge game changing play. Uh, he's been one of my favorite players on the team this year. He's really broken out, been really good where Landon Collins got hurt. And to the point where you really can say that you don't need Landon Collins next year, you can trade him away or try and maybe move into a kind of nickelback linebacker position. Curl is going to be a star in the coming years. Kendall Fuller and Ronald Darby both had better games on the defensive side this week. Also, once again, Dustin Hopkins missed another field goal. Lucky enough that the, that didn't really change the game. That was from about 53 yards. Um, that's something that he's just going to have to make. Was the NFC special teams player of the year last week. This week, though, kind of back to his old shaky form this year. Um, next week, they have the Seahawks on their schedule, who just completely bounced back this week mm-hmm. from their uh, bit of a struggle. They beat the Jets 40-3. to but the Jets are just that bad. Before that, they had a lot of struggles. Losing to the Giants, before that, they beat the Eagles by only six, the Cardinals by seven, and then lost two before that. So they've really struggled recently. And this is a game that's winnable for Washington. It's in D.C. And it's one that if they win and the Ravens lose, all they'd have to do is beat the Eagles to win the division. So it's a big game. It's one that they can win. 
And it's kind of a good matchup for Washington. These past two weeks, they've played the Steelers and 49ers, two teams who are really, really, really good defensively. Offensively, they're not the greatest. It's the exact opposite this next week. The Seahawks have really struggled defensively. They're really good offensively. So if Washington can stop Russell Wilson, if they can stop DK Metcalf, if they can stop Chris Carson, uh, their offense should be able to move the ball a bit more than they have in the past couple of weeks. So that should be a really close game. That's at 1 p.m. on Fox. Um, yeah, that's it for Washington football. The Washington Wizards had their first preseason game yesterday. No Bradley Beal, no Russell Westbrook, yet they only lost by five points to the Brooklyn Nets, who did play Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving. They're, they were without Karis LeVert, but they did have their you know two stars, also DeAndre Jordan. They were actually winning with about five minutes left at halftime. They were completely down by a lot. They were down by 18 at half, came back. They were actually winning with about three minutes left, only ended up losing by five. Overall, a pretty decent game. Their defense was non-existent for a while, but uh, Denny Avdija, the rookie, he played pretty well, went three for three from three, 15 points. Uh, Hachimura had 18 points. He was plus six. Uh, Thomas Bryant also had a good game. He was plus nine when he was on the floor. Five assists for Bryant. Um, Bonga did not play that great and missed three threes, went two for six. Uh, some of the other young guys did pretty well, but, you know, with that Westbrook or Beal only losing by five to a team that had Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving is very, very, uh, you know, it's nice to see maybe they can really do something this year. Uh, they've got a couple more preseason games coming up. They play the Pistons twice. I think that's all they have for the rest of the preseason on the 17th and then the 19th, and then they open up their regular season next Wednesday. We'll probably talk about that a bit on next week's show in Philadelphia. That's all we have for local news, some national news. The Cleveland baseball team, formerly Cleveland Indians, are now changing their name. That got leaked. They weren't supposed to announce it for the, you know, for, I guess, the coming week. So we don't know what their name's going to be yet, but that's the uh, baseball news. Sarah Fuller, the Vanderbilt kicker, was the first Power 5 uh, girl to ever score poor points. Uh, a while back, early 2000s, there was a couple, I think, New Mexico had a kicker and maybe Kent State who scored points. So it wasn't the first in Division One history, but first at the Power 5 level. Awesome. Love to see it. You know, great for her. And I think that's all the big national news there is. Uh, Giants lost, of course, Washington in first place. Big game tomorrow. Uh, do any of, you, any of you have anything else before we wrap things up? I was just going to talk about uh, the college football schedule next week because uh, Maryland plays Michigan State. What, it, what ended up happening is the Big Ten originally had said they were going to have the two divisions face the – wherever you finish in your division, you were going to face the team opposite in that place in the, in the other division. But what happened was uh, Maryland was looked like from the standings that I saw were Brett was paired with Minnesota who they already played and they were trying to avoid rematches. So they, that's why they scheduled Maryland to play Michigan state. And I believe they also are, have scheduled Indiana to play Purdue because that game got canceled because of a COVID issue. Um, the Big Ten championship game is Ohio State after the Big Ten changed their rule to that you had to play six games. They since that rule has now been changed, they play Northwestern. Uh, the big national game next week will be the ACC championship game between a rematch between Clemson and Notre Dame. This time Trevor Lawrence will play. So that will go to determining a lot of seating for the playoff, which everybody assumes will be Ohio State, Alabama. Clemson and Notre Dame with Texas A&M and a couple other teams looking on the outside, looking in and in the, the big group of five matchup um, with is the AAC championship game, which is number eight right now, Cincinnati against Tulsa. Uh, Tulsa's defense is really good, but I don't think their offense is going to be able to keep up. So I would expect Cincinnati to win that game. Uh but they also there's also a COVID issue involved in that game because they were supposed to play this week and that game got canceled because of COVID. And also the bowl season, believe it or not, starts next Saturday. Uh, SMU plays in a bowl game, and there's there's a lot they, there's bowl games starting all next week with the smaller with a lot of the smaller teams playing. I don't think we'll see any of the big boys till we get closer to Christmas. But 
we somehow we had managed to get through all of the, the or at least through the college football season to this point and they're still planning the semifinals for January 1st and the championship game for January 11th. Yeah, and actually, I think there is one other big group of five game. Uh, now in the top 10, Coastal Carolina plays number 17, Louisiana. Um, you know, things could be interesting if Coastal Carolina wins and Cincinnati loses. They'd probably jump them for that top group of five team, which would, you know, lose the AAC, that team in the, uh, I guess, what, uh, New Year's Six Bowl, which could end up losing Navy some money, coincidentally. Correct. So Navy fans are rooting for Cincinnati this week. But uh, I also think that Virginia, I believe, rejected a bull bid. So they're not going to be playing. But yeah, that's, that's all we have. Anyone else have to be That's going to be a common occurrence you're going to see this year because there's no activities. Normally these, play, these schools go to their bowl destinations for like a week, and there's a series of activities leading up to the bowl game. Um, in the area of the, like the military bowl, for example, they, the team spend the week in D.C. seeing all their sites and practicing and then come to Annapolis for the game. None of that is happening this year. So it's a, just a basic road game, like any other road game. So that's why they're, you'll see a lot of teams opting out. I, Boston college has done it. Stanford's done it. Virginia's done it. And I think the list is just going to keep growing. Yeah. So uh, at least we got through the season. <laughs> now it's uh now it's basketball. It's got to get through uh, the NFL only got three more weeks left after Monday. So they're finding a way to do it. Uh, no more NHL news as of last week, I don't think. But, yeah, unless anyone else has anything more to jump in, I guess that's nothing. Thank you all so much for joining us for this week's episode of MSB Weekly. We will, of course, be back next week. Ravens play tonight. Maryland basketball plays tonight. Everything else for the rest of the week. If you have anything else, you know, all the previews, all the recaps over on the Maryland Sports Blog website. Make sure to go check that out. Follow us. On Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, all of the sites. Thank you all so much for joining. I'll see you all next week.